Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Sneddon. We're a little bit late on this one, or later than we thought we'd be. I know we talked about this on the last episode, but in case you didn't listen, somehow a David Duchovny book slipped past us. So we're uh, six weeks out from publication date um, when we are reviewing Truly Like Lightning. Yeah, this uh, I, I explained how I, I found this one. It was like lingering in the back of a photo I took at Barnes and Noble, and um, uh, that's how I managed to, to realize that this book was out. And um, so, uh, yeah, writing the the I think our feelings about the previous Duchovny books and our our interview with Duchovny, I was excited about checking out this book, um, and uh, you know, like it's like four hundred forty pages, so it's it's not light but we'll get into that later um for for anybody who doesn't know who david Duchovny is i'm gonna read a bio even though it seems kind of ridiculous uh he's an actor writer producer director and singer songwriter known for playing fbi agent fox Mulder on the sci-fi horror action drama show the x-files and writer hank moody on the comedy drama series californication um, for anybody who's listened to us in the past, I'm more of an X-Files guy, and Livius is more of a Californication dude, I believe. Yep. Um, he was also executive producer and starred in the historically based cop drama Aquarius, which I watched and I actually did enjoy, um, but I don't think it was his strongest uh, kind of film work. Duchovny has a BA in English literature from Princeton University and an MA in English literature from Yale University. So this guy knows English literature. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's a couple things missing on here. He was in Twin Peaks. Denise, Denise in Twin Peaks. He was a guest on Booked Podcast. Also not in here, but I guess for brevity, right? We keep telling him, make it shorter, make it shorter. And I guess those are two of the things that fell off of his bio. <laughs> All right, here is the synopsis for Truly Like Lightning. Um, hopefully, there's not going to be a lot of uh, mispronunciation on my part through the course of this one. For the past 20 years, Bronson Powers, former Hollywood stuntman and converted Mormon, has been homesteading deep in the uninhabited desert outside Joshua Tree with his three wives and 10 children. Bronson and his wives, Yalula, Mary, and Jackie, have been raising their family away from the corruption and evil of the modern world. Their insular existence, controversial, difficult, but Edenic, is upended when the ambitious young developer Maya Abadessa stumbles upon their land. Hoping to make a profit, she crafts a wager with the family that sets in motion a deadly chain of events. Maya, threatening to report the family to social services, convinces them to enter three of their children into a nearby public school. Bronson and his wives agree that if Maya can prove that the kids do better in town than in their desert oasis, they will sell her a chunk of their priceless plot of land. Suddenly confronted with all the complications of the 21st century that they tried to keep out of their lives, the Powerses must reckon with their lifestyle as they try to save it. Truly like lightning, David Duchovny's fourth novel is a heartbreaking meditation on family, religion, sex, greed, human nature, and the vanishing environment of an ancient desert. Before we get into talking about this book, I would just like to point out to listeners, if you haven't read Duchovny's other works, um, each one is created very independently from the other ones. And I mean, he's uh, he's this book doesn't feel like his previous three books and none of those books feel like any of the other two. Like he he doesn't have a niche he writes in, which um, I. How do I say this? I struggle with sometimes um, I think that I know talented writers that if they stuck to one thing that they do well would do better. But I guess if you're David Duchovny, you can write whatever the hell you want and you don't have to stick to like one specific type. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, too, because um, definitely this book in his acknowledgments in the back, which is like five or six pages, there's a lot of explanation of where this book came from. Um it seems like this book arose out of just like an idea that he couldn't like purge from his mind. And I feel like those were similar circumstances for like his other books as well. Like, uh, uh Miss Subways was definitely like born out of his fascination with a specific thing, uh, from when he was in school, I believe. And then, you know, a cow going on a, you know, journey of, of, you know, finding themselves and stuff seems like it came out of, 
like a specific thing. So I feel like um, the the reason he's all over the place is because it's almost as if something presents itself that he needs to work through. I feel like, and that's definitely something that some authors have. Um, but it, like Mallerman, Josh Mallerman comes to mind where I feel like he's the type of guy who's like, Ooh, what about this? And then like goes for it. But he kind of stays in the lane of being horror as opposed to where, you know, with Duchovny, he's got some stuff with supernatural elements. He's got, you know, sentient cows. So he is kind of all over the board. And like, this is much more of a, like a straight literary fiction with no real supernatural element. And it's more of a, a almost like a, a cultural commentary kind of situation. So yeah, he's definitely got multiple lanes that he travels down. I like how you said it's almost like cultural commentary because I'm pretty sure that's like 90% of this book. Yeah, we're going to differ on that one. Okay. You want to kick it off? So the book starts out, um, I'm just going to acknowledge that uh, one thing that um, is is obvious early on in the first chapter is, 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 is pretty long. I don't know how long off the top of my head, but it goes on for a little while and it's, and it's kind of wordy. Um, and the way that I was thinking of it when I was reading the first chapter was, oh, this is kind of like how Fox Mulder talks. He just does these kind of like meandering, like intellectual, like monologues almost. And so this is written kind of that way. Would you agree? I, uh, I didn't think about it that way. But I, I, I definitely see what you're saying. And yes, it, 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 yeah, there's it, a resemblance at least. So um, if you're into the way that like Fox Mulder would explain a complex, like scientific or supernatural situation, this has that kind of like higher um, like syllable count type of feel to it. Um, but it's basically the first chapter goes into uh one of the main characters of the book, Bronson Powers, and his backstory about how he got to the point where he is in the current part of the book. So uh, the shorthand of it is he was a stuntman in Los Angeles uh, and just kind of lived a rough, like, well, a stuntman life. So you have to imagine that, like, there's, like, all of the seduction of L.A. and drugs and booze and ladies and stuff like that. Uh, And then at some point he discovers that he um, has the potential to inherit a massive plot of land in the desert area by Joshua tree with uh, the stipulation that he has to convert to, or at least make um, a realistic attempt to convert to Mormonism because the grandmother he's inheriting the land from was very like devoutly Mormon. So he is faced with an idea um he decides what the heck I'll just, I'll, I'll give it a shot. If it means I can inherit this land, that sounds pretty cool. Becomes absolutely seduced by Mormonism, becomes devout, gets his land and establishes a, a polygamous family in the desert on this land with uh, a couple of, a few wives, as it mentions in the, the synopsis. Um, So that's the first chapter is really just his, um, backstory that gets him to the that gets him from being a stunt man in LA to being a husband with multiple wives and kids in a desert plot outside of Joshua Tree. You know, you said seduced, and I think that's a really good way to put it. And and the reason I say that is to to explain. I feel, and I don't know a lot about Mormon religion. I've learned more about it in the last week than than in my previous many years. Um, I don't just think like he becomes a believer. He becomes almost fanatical to the point where I think you get to feel like he almost added his own elements to the religion. Like he interpreted some of that stuff. And and maybe it's because he didn't go to a Mormon church. He didn't grow up in a Mormon family. He read everything he could get his hands on and kind of developed his own ideas, which makes this even a little more interesting because I feel like as a character, I didn't know what to expect from him um, based on the fact that he kind of made this his own thing. Yeah, that's dead on. And I think that like, that was kind of one of the ideas was that um, his 
absolute love affair, but also his like never having been a part of the church and like, like taught things the church way, um, made it so that he almost put himself right up there with, uh, like Joseph Smith as like, you know, that's how much, how important not, he didn't make himself important in the religion, but that's how, um, he saw himself as, as the, like a, fuck, what's the word I'm looking for? Like as a representative of the religion as like, he wanted to save the world and stuff. So yeah, his fanaticism turned him not to a member of a church, but to like a representative of a belief. Yes. Very well put. Um, so as Rob mentioned, he, he uh, at some point we, we move forward a few years, but he does have a uh, three wives and a number of children, um, four, eight, I think it's 10, ten children, yeah. <laughs> 10 children. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm counting the list, 10 children. Um, and, and we move forward a, a solid 15 years or so in, into the future. So we get, we get this set up. There's also, by the way, an unbelievably great scene where the church elder who has to like approve his conversion to Mormonism and Bronson just like lays out some sh- shit for that dude. And I thought that was one of my favorite scenes in the book is where Bronson is now schooling this uh, Mormon elder right. uh, on the ways of Mormonism, but, but taking it, I, I, if this was Christianity, which I'm slightly more familiar with, I would say this is like an old Testament Christian. He's like an old Testament Mormon. You know, if, if there's some right. kind of equivalent of that where the other guys like, look, just say the right thing things that were cool and he's like no this is like the way you know i mean it was it was a very interesting um and 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 fun chapter uh to read when when he's um working on being accepted um as a mormon so we move forward 15 years we get all the setup of how he got there we get a little bit of setup of what the deal is out there and it's your it's your uh, compound um away from the world that uh, if you're listening to this, you probably belong to. So they uh, they don't have um, they don't have phones. They don't have television. Um, they're raising 10 children um, as a as a community of, of 13 people. Um, they are self-sustained with um, food that they grow and, and um, crops that they um, what is that reap. Right. You reap crops. Is that when you take them up? I think it's reap. Right. <laughs> I don't know, some yeah, kind sure. of farm, some kind of farm stuff. Right. But they're out in the middle of nowhere and they very, very rarely um, see anybody. And this is the way that Bronson wants it. And uh, the the family seems to be uh, be doing OK. Um, we uh, Maya, who is uh, probably the, the character we spend the second most time with in this book. Um, works for a company called uh, Pretor- Pretorian. Um, which is basically like a land development company, like a giant real estate company that has made huge moves um, under the leadership of her boss, Robert Maloof, um, who's your typical, um, like I kept thinking back to that movie, Wall Street, um, like like one of those mm-hmm. types of guys. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, who, who will do anything for a buck and doesn't care who he steps on. But as she's trying to climb the corporate ladder at Praetorian, um, she sees an opportunity. She's high out of her mind on a retreat with some of her coworkers, um, steals a car, winds up on Bronson's land, um, but winds up uh, coming across Bronson and his family on one of their evening outings, um, is shot by uh, via arrow by his uh, 11-year-old son, um, but has this idea that these people, she does some research, figures out who he is, that they own all this land, and she... Um, concocts a scheme is uh, the only way I can put it to get this land out from under Bronson and his family. Yeah. And that's really, uh, that's the first act setup. Um, you've got this Mormon family completely removed from the world. Um, and Maya, uh, stumbling upon them in her drug fueled, um, kind of, foray into the desert disrupts everything and it's one of those situations where when you're reading it you're like oh that this isn't good for the powers family like once they're found people aren't going to let leave them alone um uh, that's the feeling i got you know it's it was pretty obviously uh written in that way and so that's what happens she does some scheming and over the the course of a couple of months comes up with a plan pitches it to her boss and her boss is like we're doing this all off the books you know we don't talk about this over the phone we don't talk about this in email we'll just you know 
update each other in person? What kind of money do you need? Seeds her with money that she needs. And um, honestly, like the book, for being how big it is and for having a huge cast of characters, really there's not a lot of characters outside of the Bronson family that, um, that you know, play a, a big part. The only other real kind of consistent player is um, a woman named Janet Bergram. So in the in the synopsis, it said that she has this idea. Uh, Maya has this idea to uh, wager more or less with the Bronson family or with the Powers family, excuse me. Um, that if you know she sends three of his kids to public school and they do better um, than the kids being taught at home, they'll agree to sell land. Otherwise, it, what the synopsis doesn't say is that she's kind of um, threatening to just make their life real difficult uh if if they don't if the pow- the powers family doesn't go along she's gonna you know try and get the kids taken away if they're not you know th- legally taught the right way or or you know following the right protocols or have the right certifications so like she kind of backs them into a corner of hey this is what i want let's do this thing if it goes your way this is what we'll do if it goes our way this is what we'll do um Janet Bergram is like a social worker for San Bernardino and she's the one who uh, Maya gets involved to kind of grease the wheels to get the kids into school and um, that's the boring stuff what happens next is Maya pitches the idea to Powers to Bronson Powers and kind of lays out hey this is the different ways that this can go and he um he gets a little proud about it, I'd say. Um, yeah. And, you know, here's what it is. He's, uh, he's made a decision um, for his family and how he wants to have a family. Um, and, and oddly enough, and I, I don't want to get too heavy into the plot, right? Because I don't want to spoil this for anybody. But Power's family's kind of doing okay. You know, so this isn't and, and, you know, they even make references to other situations like this real world situations where you've had, you know, I mean, Waco is mentioned. Right. And then there's a couple of families uh, and I don't remember the names off the top of my head where they were like this. Right. Where you find this family that's completely off the grid and the kids are living, you know, essentially chained up in a basement or something. This is not the Powers family. The Powers family's kids are intelligent. Um, they might lack some finesse maybe in some of the sciences but they're well educated they're polite they're happy kids right so um as you probably can tell from the you know and i mentioned in the synopsis the direction we're heading bronson um is is left with no real choice right but to agree to this this wager and uh it's funny because you said there's not a lot of characters outside the bronson family there aren't even a lot of characters from the bronson family right it really focuses on the uh the adults um, and then three children who are chosen, Deuce and Pearl, who are twins. They are 17. Um, and uh, Hiram, who is 11, um, who I mentioned as the uh, bow and arrow wielding maniac from um, from Maya's <laughs> uh, first involvement uh, with them. But they are put up, um, financed and put up in uh, in Rancho Cucamonga. Am I saying that right? Yep. Um, where they will, uh, well, the two older ones will attend high school and Hiram will attend um, elementary school for one school year, so nine-ish months. And then uh, the the deal is at the end of that that uh, they will test um, the children. So they, they did tests for the children before this started, and they're going to do tests afterwards and see if they've advanced enough. And if they advance enough, then, you know, then, then Maya has won. And um, and again, we keep saying a wager and you think who would make this wager? I think Rob touched on it a little bit. You know, there there are some threats behind that. Like, hey, listen, if this is all cool, then we'll back off and we'll leave you alone. But if it's not, you've got to deal with, with us and your land. So the rest of the book is what you know, what could possibly go wrong in a situation like this? Well, you take kids who have uh, Deuce and Pearl um, are the only two children that were born outside of the compound, but they were very, very young, like two and three three or three maybe two or three when they went there so they really have no recollection of the outside world but you've taken three children who understand nothing about modern technology modern society and you literally dump them into a school setting which is um 
probably always the trendiest, right? Especially high school, like you're expected to be on your shit. Um, and then, you know, we, we followed that story to its, to its, uh, I was going to say logical conclusion. Let's just say to its conclusion. conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the rest of the book is basically like, how does this, um, gamut play out and, um, who, you know, who's, who's going to come out on top and, and really the setup just allows for, um, and and here's I said earlier I was gonna I was gonna disagree with Livius on the social commentary thing, um, I th- and the reason I say that uh, is because um, there is a ton of that absolutely like basically every aspect of society is is put under a mic- microscope but I think in a justified way because you have people who've never experienced that society so like they would have um, exaggerated reactions to things. But I, I would say that there's a lot of um, a lot of the book is uh, character study of Bronson Powers or the type of person who would uh, choose to take a family away from the world and, and, you know, raise them in what he thinks is like a perfect situation. Is it perfect? Like, is this a flawed person? So there's a lot of... Uh, there's there's a lot of the dissection of a character um for the powers people but also like the greedy people like maya and to a degree her boss robert maloof um and then yeah but but yeah there's a lot of social um social situations put under a microscope for sure yeah yeah, and I I don't know, and that's that's the thing. I, I I agree with you. There's definitely a lot of character development, mostly for for Bronson, right? And and I'll say this: the the kids, we don't spend a, a lot of time w- with the kids, and and we see them develop very quickly, right? Like over the course of like two months, they're completely different people from who when they were living um, in Agada de Vida, which is the name of the 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 compound is probably a a, a bad term for the homestead that the the powers live on but also i felt like almost um like there was commentary there so I, i'm thinking you know people lived like this um be, before modern day right so I'm, I'm sure we can go back less than a hundred years and, and there were still a lot of people living kind of homesteading where they weren't really attached to to society and, and stuff so I, I feel like it's a, a dual like not only are we looking at society today but we're looking at society we're looking at mormon society right so the 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 maybe radical mormon society but also the society of the past because that's really the way they live i mean there's mention of things like you know he's frankenstein some motorcycles together so they like they have a truck and they have a few motorcycles so it's not like they're living like it's the 1700s um but they are they're doing it on their own and and you know make what you will of it i think he does a good job of of um kind of expressing the difference between that, both in showing us what they do, but then showing us through the eyes of the kids and even um, the, the, the parent that comes with the children, Mary, um, you know, is returning to society after 15 years. And she's, she was like a Venice Beach performer. So she was definitely, you know, hard into the, that culture. And watching her return, it, it kind of worked on both ways, if I'm making any sense. Oh, uh, totally. Get my point across that. Yeah. And I think that was the, there's a lot. Of, so what this book does, I think is it makes you think about things from, you know, perspectives that maybe you wouldn't naturally adopt. I think one of the things I like about it is that the family does work so well, um, on its own. Like he figured out how to make these 13 people just a well-oiled machine. They're smart. They're, they're nice. They're capable. Like they know how to work with, crops and cattle and they ride lots of horses and you know so if if they were the whole world it would be eden but it's when you introduce them back into society that um now that there's a contrast between how they are and how the rest of the world is it it, it gets interesting because like at face value it seems like it's saying oh like bronson's entire thing was the world is an awful place it even says it in the synopsis and he's he's 
he's leaving like the the corruption behind and everything um but from the society's perspective these people living off on their own are these crazy like bible thumping like like extremists almost not extremists in like a terrorist way but they're very extreme in their beliefs i guess i should say so um he doesn't put i don't think he puts any one character or one type of person into a specific um like judgment like he kind of shows you both sides of of most of the people that are represented in this book like the good side and the bad side of the mormon people the good side and the bad side of the greedy you know um modern era people and stuff like that if at least that's how i saw it i agree wholeheartedly and and that's one of the things i found really interesting um about this uh, about this book is if you take the children like when I say that, just as a group, you take the children out of play, right? Everybody in this is flawed. And, and in some ways, you know, yep. uh, evil is probably a strong word. But you know what I mean? Like yep, it totally. shows the bad part of, I think, every single adult that's named in this book. You know, so some some crimes or whatever, maybe less than others, but everybody kind of working to their own end through whatever means necessary. And that was kind of the interesting thing, because, you know, if you had to call a protagonist, right, you'd have to say, well, I don't know, maybe Bronson's the protagonist, but is there a hero in this book? No, I don't I don't think there is. To, not is, to derail your thought, but I want to say something really quick, and this might be yeah. off the... The only person that is kind of unassailable is Jackie, and she's the one who suffered and died. Well, yes, so <laughs> that's, that's a good point, right? She's not actually in the book. Like she right. is expired <laughs> before any of this book takes place. So yeah, that's, but yeah, I mean, and that's, that was kind of interesting because, you know, okay. So when you start reading a book, right, the first person they tell you about, you say, okay, this is, this is their story, right? So we're expected to be attached to this person. And and in parts, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, you know what? I don't see a problem with someone deciding to live their life that way. So I, I getting behind his story and kind of learning about what they do. And I'm kind of fascinated by it. Clearly, things change through the course of the book. But then so you say to yourself, well, Maya, the one who wants to break this up is the hero. Well, she's not the fucking hero either, <laughs> you know, and neither is her boss. And, and even even the social worker who is probably the least at fault still has motivations that impact how she handles things. And I think that's the, the thing I want to give Duchovny credit for more than I think he told an engaging story. So let me get that out of the way. But the fact that he didn't try to exalt any one person um, in this story, like I said, the kids are the kids, you know, and, and, and they have varying degrees of success and likability through the course of the book. Um, but, yeah, the adults, uh, all of them under indictment. I fully agree. And I, I was reflecting on that as I was getting toward the end of the book. I was like, um, because I always look for, like, what is what is the deeper meaning? What's the message? Who Who do we like? Who don't we like? I, I'm sure we all do. I'm not saying this is the special thing I do. Um, and so like, I, I kind of arrived at a very similar thing, which um, there's not a lot of people who don't carry blame. Um, and there's not a clear good guy, like, like you were saying, Livia. So I fully, I, I fully agree with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I feel like this is like, there are some books where that you can approach them at like the level that you choose to, you can just take it as like some light entertainment or you could like think deeper about it. And it's like a more like a richer story. And I feel like this one kind of makes you think more about things than it doesn't really give you like the, the easy ride option. I don't know if you agree with me on that, but like it, it's, it's, it's definitely a thinker of a book. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I disagree slightly. I think people can just breeze through this and choose not to look at that stuff. Do you know what I mean? But I yeah. think it's a richer book if you if you spend the time to to put the thought into it. Okay. Um, when we uh, when we announced we were doing this book and we were off the air at that point, I'd looked up some of the reviews because I was like, oh, it's already got like 80, 90 reviews or whatever. 
So, of course, what I do, I went to some five stars. I went to some one stars. And I want to address this one because I read this to Rob. And I want to uh, address it to the audience, right? So, and I can see where, where someone's coming from with this. Um, it says it's too political. The story is simply not believable and the writing is too political. So I don't think the story is not believable. The wager part, I struggled with a little bit here and there. You know, this is me, not not the review, by the way. I'm, um, You know, but the writing is too political. I find extremely irritating when writers try to shove their political views down your throat. I will not be buying any more Duchovny's books. Not sure if I will finish this one. I was concerned because I am 100% with this person, Mary, on the I find it extremely irritating when writers try to shove their political views down your throat. Don't think that's what happened here. Um, if you read the, uh, the the author's note at the end, you'll understand. And, and Duchovny addresses this a little bit himself. But I think that it gave a pretty fair shake to the different types of people. And, and when I say fair, you know, good things and, and, and not good things, as we just mentioned. And that's probably um, the only other book I can think of that had... Um, a lot of political slant to it that was like this was um, Rob Hart's The Warehouse, which I also believe I gave him credit for doing a good job, at least in trying to be even keeled. Yep. And not just, you know, moving through a story through the lens in which he sees the world, but understanding that there are other thoughts and ideas out there. So <clears throat> and uh, I think Duchovny did a pretty good job of that in this book. I would say, especially since he makes no effort to like mask how he feels about things in the in the acknowledgments um he he did when he represented so not not to throw it all into a political perspective but when he represented um the the right winger people he he did it you know like he gave them the the kind of what the stereotypical he gave them what that merry person was complaining about but he also gave them like a you know, you know, a, a fairer shake too. But when there was like the other side, the liberal people, um, you saw the good and bad from those people too. So um, I will agree. And I was hyper aware because once Livius read that, I was like, oh, I know he hates this stuff. So maybe we shouldn't even do this book. Um, but um, I, I think that Duchovny rose above uh, the idea of just you know, using his book as an opportunity to shit on a, a, a person or a belief and made it more a representation of what happens in the real world. While I'm on the one star reviews, I guess I'm going to read this other one. There's only two one star reviews. I'm not approved, but really a lot of the swear words weren't necessary. All they did was throw me out of the story. Did you feel and I, I guess we're different creatures, right? But did you I, like I'm trying to think like when the kids would 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 um, curse like the parents would tell them to stop. Yeah. So I, I was so just thinking. <laughs> there's another one and I think it might be a two star one um, that complained about how he really likes to write graphic sex scenes. And when I read that review, I was like, was there a sex scene? I don't like I don't remember. Uh, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. I, I do remember there's one. I don't even know if it's a sex scene, but it, it really kind of gets um, but yeah, no, I don't, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I mean, are we just that callous? Was there just a no. shit ton of swearing and a lot of sex scenes? And like, we're so callous that we just, you know, I know you accuse me of this with like gore and stuff where I'm just like, that eh, didn't affect me at all. Like I hardly <laughs> noticed it. Maybe, maybe that's where we're getting to be in our old age. I mean, uh, that is a possibility, but like, I, I, here's what I'll say. If there was, there wasn't enough to make me be like, oh, man, there's a lot of boning in this story. And I feel like I would think that if it was like gratuitous or you know what I'm saying? So um, not everybody. I wonder... What did I say to someone one time? Not everybody is qualified to have an opinion. <laughs> so listen, well, we're professional. Yeah, so we are qualified. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> and people should take some stake in what we have to say. I wonder how many of these reviews are written by Mormons. Like, I wonder uh, if hmm. the Mormon community actually is like, oh, hey, this book is about, like, Mormon homesteaders, and they pick it up. And is that why, you know, there was too much swearing for one person or too much sex for somebody else? Like, I don't know. I had not thought of that. It's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Either way, I think that I'm not saying that – So. I'm just saying those particular negative reviews are a little off base. Um, but, you know, I'm sure some of the 
glowing five star ones are like, I love Mulder. So like, you know, yeah. what can you do? Yeah. And that's and that's fair. And we saw it to be <laughs> fair. We saw a lot of that is commentary to our reviews and our interview with him. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, I don't that's it's like I said, it goes back to I. He's a talented, talented writer that is overshadowed, I think, by his acting career, which let's face it. I mean, one of them made him, I'm going to assume, you know, gazillions of dollars. Right. And the other one probably gets him a couple nice paychecks here and there. So he should he should. I'm happy he leaned into acting, but he is a very talented writer. Um, his acknowledgments also kind of talk about, I think, um, some of the inspirations for the story that became this book were particular authors or particular works by authors that he was studying when he was in college. And, um, I think he said that he got into acting because he wasn't like, there was something he, he didn't feel quite ready about with writing. I can't remember exactly. I read the acknowledgments a while back, but anyway, like he, it, if you read the book, check it out because he kind of goes into that a little bit and it's interesting. Uh, also, like it's nice to see that Chris Carter is one of his like beta readers. I saw that. I was like, Oh wow. He's just, Hey, Chris Carter, I need you to read this for me. Tell me what you think. All right. Now, now this is not a shot. Chris Carter is Chris Carter doing anything. I mean, has he done anything since the X-Files and some of those spinoff shows oh, like millennium or didn't, it wasn't it. Wait, was that, I'm I'm pulling him up oh, on no. IMDb, yeah. but me too. Uh, no, he has recently um, been at the helm of some X Files um, anthology like s- story series. Um, here's the thing: when you create the X Files, I mean, you can just uh, that that's enough. I like that it is IMDb. <laughs> Jesus. Based on the characters created by him, he also has a listing of The Sex Files, a dark triple X parody, and the sequel, The Sex Files 2, a dark triple X parody. Oh, God. Just because it's based on his characters. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but it looks like really, um, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, yeah, Millennium and then X Files and The Lone Gunman and then, you know, the revival of The X Files. But other than that, there's Harsh Realm. I don't seem to remember yeah. that. It was only nine episodes. But yeah, it seems like he did X Files and then was like, yeah, I'm done. God bless him. Like, well, this is what I was. We've talked about this before. Some, I, you know, if I got one movie that paid me like, you know, twenty five million dollars, no one would ever hear from me again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the other side of that is like, Tom Cruise doesn't need the money. Just step down and let someone else take the limelight. Let's let's get some fresh talent in there. Like, if you do the one big thing and you blow up, step aside. Give us give us someone else to give us some new art. Yeah. I uh, I agree. This reminds me of the James Spader interview I read when people asked him. They're oh, like, yeah. oh, well, yeah, you do last day. He's like, well, he's like, you know, I have some money and uh, I'll do something when I need more money. And That's... then he went on to do. There's like 30 seasons now of that last show he was in. Yeah, I, I stopped blacklist. watching after like the second. How is that thing still going? I People love it, apparently. I haven't watched it since like season three or whatever, but yeah. But uh, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, I always thought that's exactly how I would live my life. I get big fat paychecks, I'll come back to work when it's time when I need more big fat paychecks. Yeah, till then you just wander into the desert. Yes, my own little homestead. You would never do that, right? Uh, I well, I don't think I could like do all the work that needs to be done, but if the work was being done by someone, I I'd, I'd go off the grid. That's, where he, that's why he had those three wives. That's true. Yeah. Probably a lot of books to read. There I know we should probably get to our wrap up, but there is something appealing about that. Um I don't think I can do it either. I'm I'm just as dependent on on modern necessities as as the next person, but there is something appealing about just saying fuck it and kind of moving on to to do your own thing. <laughs> So, but yeah, I'm with you, dude. I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. grow anything or God, I can only imagine having to go out and like cut a cow's throat or something. I, I don't think I could do it. On that note, do you want to start wrap ups? Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a good <laughs> time. Um, look, um, four for four to has delivered, uh, an entertaining, um, story and, and maybe, maybe, and I mean, there's some time between the last three and this one, maybe more thought provoking, um, than than his other works so 
you know, we had a, a, a father and son kind of baseball, almost memoir style book. We had a modern day retelling of a mythological story. We had a book about a talking cow. Um, and then we had this, which really um, I felt dug deeper into people um, and what their motivations are and what their beliefs are and their reactions and interactions with people who um, are not from the same background as they are. Um, so for me, this was his most thought-provoking book. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was uh, pleased at how well he handled um, the aspects of uh, you know, not just politics, but beliefs in, in showing, but it would have been really easy for someone for a less talented or less devoted writer to just say Mormon people living in the desert bad and spend, you know, 350 pages on why that's the wrong thing. And, and quite honestly, I, he, he, he didn't do that. Um, he found flaws in people and, and he, he worked those flaws into the story. Um, for for like I said, literally every adult that take that's in the book, um, which made it uh, more interesting. It's always weird to read a book that doesn't have a, a clear hero, um, but when done well, you know you, you get something um, like this. I uh, I really liked, um, and when I say the characters, it's not that I really, really liked the characters. The characters are very very well written. Um, I, I think his use of language was really solid in this, and uh, and and I liked the pace. Um, I did see one review that said it could have been a hundred pages less. I, I don't know about that. I, I was a little worried at how wordy it was in its um, description of Mormonism and and Bronson's journey into it. And I was like, I think I messaged Rob, and I was like, holy shit, I'm twenty pages in, and this is super dense. Um, but it really opens up after that that introductory section. That, that gets you caught up to, to where we're at today. Um, I hope David Duchovny keeps writing books. This one, after uh, averaging out our eight categories, I came up with an 8.13 out of 10. Yeah, we liked the other three books. And um, I think even when we were talking about Miss Subways, we probably called out the fact that there isn't really like a... Um, like raging similarity between his books. Uh, I was interested in reading about uh, a family of Mormons living this ideal life and having it disrupted by um, like modern society uh, because uh, I'm an outsider to religion in general. And um, so it's always fascinating for me to see the depiction of people whose religion is the focus of their lives. And um, like Olivia said earlier, he could have really just painted a simple picture of these people. And he did not, he did not in the least, he made them very nuanced. He made them great in a lot of ways. And he gave them flaws in a lot of ways. Um, he didn't do surface level um, pitfalls of, of a heavily religious person he did he built into these characters um like real uh you know unique qualities so that was that was well done and it carries on to the rest of the characters like Livia said the character development is wonderful uh the story is unique and interesting it's it makes it so it's easy to play off of the contrast between one thing and another um, whether it's religion and not religion, whether it's this homestead life versus, you know, the modern society, whether it's, you know, right versus left. Um, the book is just ripe for seeing things from different perspectives and kind of making your own decision about what's what's good and what's bad um, without it telling you on its own. Um all it's just it's a really fascinating book it made me think a lot um and it was entertaining it carried you through uh there was there was definitely plenty of substance for you know the the development of the individual characters and then like the arc of the overall story was well developed so the dude just knows how to write a book he he knows how to craft an interesting and compelling story that takes you forward um i was very happy with the way that it all played out I was, it was interested because like, 
and this won't really spoil anything, but even in the last, I don't know, maybe like, like 15% of the book, or maybe even like the last 10% of the book, you weren't really sure how this was going to play out. So it really built until the very end. But when the ending ended up being what it was, I thought it was really great. I thought it was well done. So overall, he crafted a great book um, in all of all the metrics in general. The only thing that I dinged a little bit was pace. And it was more because um, it was fine with me, but I, I imagine that there would be people who would think that it was like somewhat overly verbose and that that would kind of slow things down a little bit. But uh, also it's a huge, huge ass book um, at 440 pages. Overall, I, I had almost nothing really... I, I don't think I have anything negative to say about that. The pace thing was just a little bit off for me, so that got a 7, and that's the lowest of all the 8 categories for me. Overall, I gave it 8.5 out of 10, so just a little bit higher than Livius, and our average overall is 8.3125 out of 10, which I think is a great score. It is. You don't have to think it. Factually, it's a great score. It is. <laughs> Um, all right, now let's now let's talk about now let's talk about the the elephant in the room. Did it throw you out of the story every time one of his wives referred to him as bro? Um, it <sighs> it it <laughs> threw me off balance a little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I was trying. I was like, well, Bronson is it broad? And I was like, oh god, that's even worse. Yeah, that's worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Bron would have been fine. Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah, but. but bro was was uh bro was tough bro was tough and i mean <laughs> i it probably only happened like 15 times but every time i read it i was like oh fuck here we go again like it was just yeah. it, it stood out so much that it, it you know if you ask me how it felt they must have called that 300 times and i'm sure it's like a dozen so um any rate um nice job mr decovney if you happen to hear this at some point <laughs> um nice job i'm looking forward to what next must be like a space opera from him <laughs> oh god <laughs> Hey, can we talk about Mormon stuff a little bit? Yeah, let's do it. So I want to talk about the fact that, uh, so we, we mentioned that there's an acknowledgement uh, in the back of the book, and he, he explains a lot of the book. And one of the things he does is he makes mention of back in 2000, so this idea has been cooking in his head for a while, um, he got really fascinated with um, this Mormon forger, whose name I'm looking up now because I can't remember... Uh, named Mark Hoffman and um, the he was fascinated by the idea that this guy was a forger and he was like so into forging um, these documents that you know if he had this idea that if people believed they were real and authentic then that was just as good as if they actually were and uh, he got really fascinated by this idea and that led to him writing an episode of the X-Files called Hollywood AD, which was, I looked this up because I watched it, season seven, episode 19. And um, he wrote this episode where he he changed the story a little bit. It's someone who's uh, forging like Catholic or Christian or whatever documents. So it's very similar. Um, and so uh, the, all of that is to say that he's been playing around with the idea of like, the story of Mormonism and, and stuff all the way back 20 years ago. But I think one of the things that he said in the acknowledgements that really stuck with me was um, the idea of like someone uh, like an actor believing something so like he, that he was the character so much that he became the character, like that kind of thing. And so that kind of played in my mind a little bit with the Bronson character believing so much that he represented the religion that like to him, he kind of did in a way. So um, long-winded way of saying everybody should check out the Hollywood AD episode of the X-Files. So I looked up this uh, Hoffman guy and I'm kind of scrolling through the Wikipedia. So he forged a lot of Mormon documents. Um, yeah. But he also forged um, and sold signatures, including George Washington, John oh, Adams, yeah. John Quincy Adams, Daniel Boone, John Brown, Andrew Jackson, Mark Twain, Nathan Hale, John Hancock, etc., etc. Um. There you go. This uh, reminds me, we just read a book about a forger just a couple of weeks ago, The oh. Contortionist Hand. So we come, come full circle on uh, on forgery. And um, 
before I forget to say it, the Mark Hoffman character, there's that Netflix sh- series that came out recently called Murder Among the Mormon. And that series, which I think is like four hour long episodes, is 100% about Mark Hoffman and the forgeries. So if you want to get deeper into that, um, that is, it's actually really good. I watched it recently. All right. I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction before we get too far away from Mormonism. Do you, I, I, I think I know your answer to this, but I'm going to ask. Do you ever become a little envious of people, and we'll, we'll use Bronson in this situation, that have such a strong belief in something like outside of themselves, like a higher power? Because I, I also I share your non-religious feelings, but I do once mm-hmm. in a while, man. I'll look at someone who's really devout, and I, I'm, I'm a little envious that they have something to believe in. I'm not just devout, right? I could take this to people who are convinced that the earth is flat, like that they have this belief that's bigger than themselves, that they hold that dearly. Do you ever, do you ever look at, and at least, and I know your feelings on religion are are a little tougher than mine. Like, although I have no religious beliefs, I don't really (laughs) care that other people do. And like I said, in some ways I envy the sense of community and, and, and once in a while, and even reading this through Bronson's eyes, I was like, man, that guy really, you know, has formulated what his life path is because he has this belief in something bigger than himself do you ever find yourself in a situation like that um not in as much as um i wish i could feel that but absolutely in the way of like i wish i would un- i had a way to understand it better um i f- i it is something that i've never like i mean i've had i've been absolutely certain about things in my life but like not to the like the religious like full faith, like minus, you know, proof or evidence or whatever type of, of belief that you're talking about. So like, um, I think I see it more as I'm fascinated by the idea that someone could be fully, I don't want to say blindly, but you know what I'm saying? Like fully faithful in something, uh, in a way that I never have been. I want to know more about that, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm missing out. Yeah, and I don't most of the time, but every now and then, and even a little bit in this book, you know, it's like this guy like uprooted his whole life around this belief, you know, and I wonder what that's like, and I'm yeah. a little envious that, you know, so at any rate, it's interesting. I, I always have found religion fascinating, even being a non-believer, and I don't imagine that's going to change. I work with somebody who's who's a devout Catholic who um, I, I think thinks I can be converted, and... um yeah, you know, that's the whole thing. And, and what I told this person was, look, it's not that I'm opposed to the idea. If some, right. if one day I wake up or something happens that, that causes me to, to feel something, you know, whatever, bigger, stronger, more spiritual than myself, then who knows? Maybe maybe I'll be in the pew next to you that following Sunday. So I'm not I'm not closed off to it, but it hasn't happened. And I mean, let's be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm past middle age at this point so you know I'm, I'm i'm at least you know at a minimum halfway there i don't think it's going to happen but i mean whatever i'm open to it <laughs> yeah i've always taken kind of the like whatever gets you there kind of approach like uh, if religion is the thing you need to make you like the best person you can be like that's great you know i'm never going to criticize that but like if you're the type of person that uses religion to manipulate people and like be not good Obviously, I'll have a problem with that. Um, so, I, in the in the in the case of this book, if I was that Maya character and I had taken a bunch of peyote and stumbled upon these these people, um, I think I'd have a strong urge to just like leave them alone, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which ultimately we would have had no story. Yeah, it'd be that a shitty book. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's yeah, and I think. There's a point in every book, and now I'm moving away from religion, I guess. There's always a point in a book where you're like, man, this all could have ended in the second chapter if people just like took care of their own shit, right? Like, yeah, that's, so yeah. that's why we have a story. But yeah, I've watched some uh, homesteading shows over the last few months. Um, it's it's interesting, and not like that. I mean, these people go into town and buy the things they need, but dude, these people, man go out there and a lot of them have it would be like if you and i said that's it we're fucking homesteading i I bought us a two acres in the middle of a fucking forest let's go figure it out 
some of them are so under fucking prepared for anything. So the the show is there's a guy, uh, it's a family, it's a, uh, a father and his son and daughter who have been living on a homestead in Alaska their entire lives. I think it's called Homestead Rescue, um, where they show up and they have like a week to get their place like livable, you know, and it's uh, it's it's interesting for for sure. Like I said, not something I'd want to take on myself, um, but it's interesting to see how these people try to make their life for themselves without anything that you and I are, are sitting within, you know, 15 feet of right now. Yeah, I would have, I would definitely have trouble with that. But while you were saying that I did have a great idea. All right. I'm, I'm listening. So I'm going to pitch this. It's going to be a hard sell, but like okay. there are two authors um, who we've had on this podcast and I want to put them together to kind of combine truly like lightning and devolution basically so basically you got the powers family from this book that we just reviewed but instead of like money hungry land developers stumbling upon them it's yetis dude i think the powers family would have fucked those yetis up. yeah yeah you're right i don't know though. like <laughs> maybe they would have converted them to mormonism there, or or that, which probably, so. <laughs> quite honestly, would have made would have made a better story than than just because then again it would be like chapter three it would be like Hiram fucked them all up with a bow and arrow because if you remember in that book they were all inept right you had like the old right, Russian lady yeah. who kind of knew some things because she grew up in a in a village in peril and everybody else like the one lady was like oh yetis I'm gonna go do fucking yoga yep so yeah well I think there's something to it let's get Max Brooks and David Duchovny on the line and uh, see what we can make out of this. We'll do it after this. We're not going to make people wait oh. to listen to a pitch to these two. Cause I'm sure if we right. call either one of them right now, they're going to pick right up. So, well, yeah, they're waiting by the phone. Yep. All right. Um, I know it's going a little long and I'm going to do this really shortly. I know you haven't seen it, but um, cherry, it's a book we reviewed and we both really enjoyed if memory serves correctly. And uh, that just hit Apple TV um, this past Friday. So we're recording this on, on Sunday, the 14th of March. So a few days ago, um, I liked it. And I'm going to say the thing that everybody that's read a book and then saw a movie said, it's not as good as the book. Um, but the saving grace of the movie, I think the thing the book did really well was it was all narrated by the main character. And I think his, his style, his thoughts or whatever came through and made that book um, endearing and enjoyable, despite all the fucked up shit that happens in it. Um, they salvaged some of that for the movie. I think the acting is great. Tom Holland does a great job. Um, and so does, and I don't have it pulled up, uh, the young lady that plays his girlfriend also does a, a very good job. And I will say, Rob, for you, because I know you've read the book, um, it does end a little differently than the book. Oh, yeah. Ciara Bravo. It's Ciara Bravo. And what a cutie, too, by the way. She's adorable. You know, but, she's got a little like baby face. Yes. Yes, she does. Well, yeah. And she's very, she's, <laughs> she's far more believable in her younger iteration. Like, <laughs> you know, than, than she is, you know, a few years later, like after he gets out of the military. Um, but they both did a, a tremendous job. Um, still some laughs to be had, but uh, very true to the book uh, from what I remember, except like I said, and the ending isn't wildly different or anything, but there's, there's a, a little extra at the end. Oh, cool. Say that. Um, this is like a big deal too, because like, uh, this, uh, so you got Tom Holland, who's basically like somehow simultaneously he's Spider-Man in the Marvel universe, but he's also doing all these like indie movies. Like he is on everything. Um, he did a great job in the devil all the time. Uh, so that inspired tons of confidence from me in the fact that he could do good in this. So that's, uh, that's good to hear. Yeah. And now, um, he's, he's, uh, He's, I don't know how to say this the right way. He's <laughs> positioning himself to maybe be James Bond one day. I was oh, reading an yeah. article about how exciting that would be for him. But then again, I guess um, everybody's positioning themselves to be James Bond. I sent in a, a little uh, <laughs> a little short film that, that I made because um, oh. I also want James Bond. I can't. I would give real money to see your James Bond highlight reel. Yeah, well, let's see how much real money you're, you're willing to give up and we'll see if I All send right. it to you. All right. Well, we'll see. We don't have a we don't have Patreon anymore for me to to try to, to, to yeah. inspire people to to donate for me to post that on there. So 
Oh, uh, yeah, I plan to check that out. I'll probably get to it uh, tomorrow or the next night. I don't think I'm going to watch it tonight, but it's on my it's high on my list of things to get done. All right. I am going to give you the rundown on the next um, couple of episodes. So um, Joshua Chaplinsky's Paradox Twins um, next week. The following week, a review of Maxwell's Demon. And I, I say that thinking that everybody is going to be as excited as we are. And look, Stephen Hall's a great writer and the Raw Shark text is legend. I don't know how many people feel strongly as strongly about it as, as we do. Um, I, I know one person that doesn't, right? Right? SPF. You're talking about, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's on the books. So I know we've talked about it a little bit. We do have a scheduled interview with Stephen Hall. Highlight of 2021 for this podcast. You know, I mean, it. it's something Rob and I have fantasized about for the entire almost 10 years we've been doing this podcast. And that is coming to fruition in just a couple of weeks. Yep, that's uh, I'm excited about that. I I I, I don't um, show excitement very much, but um, I, I it's funny because Livius we we like share an email for the podcast, and sometimes I'll read the stuff or I'll send the emails. Sometimes he'll read the stuff, he'll send the emails, and I I got to watch this back and forth of planning out the um the interview unfold and every time I saw a new email I was like oh this feels nice so uh definitely looking forward to that and um we actually got a little uh shout out on the social media from Stephen Hall um I had posted on the booked account a picture of our upcoming books which was this Duchovny book also the Paradox Twins book and Maxwell's Demons and I said our next several episodes are going to be fire and he shared that on his story saying, looking forward to talking demons and sharks with booked podcasts. So that was, that was kind of nice. I like that he uh, allowed in there for us to talk about sharks too. <laughs> yeah. I feel like good. we got the okay to be like, all right, so Maxwell's demon was fun. Let's talk about shark text. Yep. Yeah. So that's good. Looking forward to that. Very, very excited about that. Yep. So, uh, uh, that's it. I am off to finish Joshua Chaplinsky's book so I can reread Maxwell's Demon. I'm also trying, guys, I'm trying. If, if, if you're a Mormon, pray for me. Um, trying to get a reread of the Raw Shark text in and trying Ooh. to do all of this in like 10 days. So, <laughs> well, we'll see how we'll see how that shakes out because I was uh, unable to um, <clears throat> just take a week off work, which is what I wanted to do. So I could just uh, immerse myself in all of this instead i'm going to do this while working full time so uh but that's the plan and that's the next few episodes you'll be hearing from us and it's we got the daylight savings time so you even lost an hour so you're even more against the clock so let's get you out of here yeah can i tell you how fucking sleepy i am right now <laughs> I tell you seriously so past my bedtime uh, yeah all right that's gonna wrap it up thanks for joining us come back next time we're going to be talking about some twins in a paradox until then i'm rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Keep reading. <laughs>